Today we're going to talk about polyatomics and valence bond theory, and see how to work out the mathematics of the wave functions with weighting coefficients when you combine different atomic orbitals into hybridized orbitals. So the guiding focus for this lecture and the next lecture that will come is about the bond angle in something like water. Okay, so in H2O, we're often told the bond angle here is 104.5 degrees. And depending on what level of chemistry you're doing, you're going to get a different answer for the question, why is this the bond angle? So think about why this would be the bond angle of water. And a lot of times in general chemistry, right, or organic chemistry, you might get an explanation like, well, you know, the, the lone pair on water here, there's two of them in this Lewis dot type structure. And these simply take up more space and repel more strongly. And so instead of a tetrahedral geometry where it's 109.5, this angle right here gets smushed down a little bit because these electrons are taking up more space. And it gets smushed down from 109.5 to 104.5. Okay, and that's what sort of is predicted by VSEPR theory, sometimes called Vesper theory, but this is total garbage, right? These electrons don't repel more strongly or take up more room, okay? Electrons are all these negative charge cloud densities. Some don't repel more strongly than the other, right? The reason that the bond angle is 104.5 is because that's the angle when coupled with the hydrogen oxygen distances that leads to the lowest total energy when solving the Schrodinger equation, right? So the reason that the water bond angle is 104.5 is, well, that's the angle when coupled with bond distances. That leads to the lowest total energy when you're solving the Schrodinger equation. Right, everything in quantum mechanics is about solving the Schrodinger equation. We'll just call it SE here for short. Okay, the problem is solving the Schrodinger equation is a monumental task. We've already seen in previous lectures that even beyond the hydrogen atom, it's not solvable. So you have to make approximations. And so once we build up to polyatomics, multiple atoms, it's super unsolvable if that's a thing. And so we justify these bond distances and the shapes of different molecules with these sort of half-truths and sometimes flat-out lies for general chemistry students, right? But now we're in quantum mechanics. Now we're in physical chemistry. Now we know something about particle wave duality and what electrons really are. We'd like to solve the Schrodinger equation. We can't, but we can use more advanced explanations and bonding theories. Right? So we have different bonding models here. Okay, the first couple are the ones we learn in general chemistry. They might be uh, Lewis dot. They might be valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Right? This is the one we used to justify incorrectly on the previous slide that these valence electrons that are lone pairs are repelling more strongly somehow than the other bonding pairs. So that's valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. These two in tandem are sometimes called localized electrons, right? They don't really encompass quantum mechanics, right? They assume these electrons are these little particles, which we know is flat out wrong. A better model is the one we're gonna talk about today, valence bond. And while it's not a full quantum mechanical treatment of Schrodinger's equation, it's at least acceptable to me as a quantum mechanicist. It's not perfect, but it does use some quantum mechanics ideas. 
right? And it encompasses these because it's talking about using orbitals, right? Which is this notion that electrons are sort of delocalized and we only talk about certain areas of probability that the electrons are in. And that's what we're gonna be then developing today is using this valence bond theory to work towards this explanation of hybridization of orbitals and ultimately in the next lecture, learn about more advanced MO theory. This is coming for polyatomics next lecture, a more full quantum mechanical treatment to explain why water is bent. Let's talk more first about valence bond theory because it is something we use quite often in talking about chemical bonding. And it involves hybridization, which is something clearly we've heard by now, but we need a quantum mechanical model and explanation for it. So valence bond theory is gonna take different atomic orbitals. Here we're just gonna talk about S and P, but it could be D or F. Here we're gonna recast S and P atomic orbitals. and recombine them as linear combinations. And we've seen this terminology before, right? Linear combinations of atomic orbitals. That's how we first built molecular orbitals a couple lectures ago. So all we're doing is the same thing here. We're just gonna be more cleverly combining these atomic orbitals and combining them linearly, adding them together. That's all that means. So we're gonna combine these atomic orbitals to generate new orbitals. And so let's think about, as an example to start with, not water, but ethene. C, double bond C. We know there's then four hydrogens in total. And here we go. And you could come up with some prediction of this from Lewis structure of VSEPR theory, I suppose, but really the best model is hybridization. Okay, and we explain this by, instead of considering sort of the hydrogen 1s orbital and the carbon 1s2, 2s2, 2p2 orbitals all separate, we combine the hydrogen 1s orbitals with some of the carbon orbitals. Okay, so normally, right, hydrogen is just going to be 1s1, and our carbon is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. But now what we're going to do is take this hydrogen orbital and combine it with some of the atomic orbitals on carbon. Now it's true there's only two p electrons on carbon, but it has access to 2px, 2py, and 2pz. While hydrogen has access here really to just this 1s orbital. So what we're gonna do now is combine the hydrogen 1s orbital with some of the carbon orbitals. We're gonna combine it with the 2px and 2pz atomic orbitals of carbon. So we're gonna take this carbon configuration and instead of being a 1s orbital, a 2s orbital, a 2px, 2py, and 2pz, we're gonna recast this. Okay, so now carbon is instead going to be 1s2 and a combination of this 2s orbital combined with 2px and 2pz. So we're going to combine it with two different p orbitals. All right, this is going to be explained later as sp2 hybridization. You can have sp3 hybridization, but that's not what happens in the ethene molecule. Okay, so now carbon is not going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2px, 2py, 2pz. It's going to be 2py, and then some combination of three new orbitals. Why is it three new orbitals? Because I'm combining 2s, 2px, and 2pz, shuffling them all up, and creating three new atomic orbitals out of those coupled individual atomic orbitals. Okay, so now it's going to be some new atomic orbital. We're going to say psi A, 
some new atomic orbital psi b, and some new atomic orbital psi c. Okay, and then these represent my newly created atomic orbitals. Now, where do the electrons go? Well, there's going to be one in 2py and one in each of these. Right, because we took this 2s2 and combined it with one of the electrons in this 2p2 configuration. Right, so one of the 2p electrons is still in a conventional p orbital, but the other three coming from 2s on carbon and two of the 2p orbitals on carbon are going to be creating these three new atomic orbitals. Okay, so you can think about the carbon atom here, you know, still having its core 1s2, and it's still having its usual 2p y. Maybe y is into and out of the page, right? But now what we're trying to create are three new orbitals. And so these are the shapes that are going to be needed to explain this chemical structure. And that's really what we're after here. We have a mathematical representation of what these new wave functions look like that are linear combinations of these conventional ones that explain this structure. And so how are we going to mathematically represent these? Okay, so let's think about this psi A, psi B, and psi C. Right, the combination here, as I've said, is combining 2pz, 2px, and 2s. So this new carbon atomic orbital is going to be some weighted contribution, we'll call it c1 for that weighting coefficient, times the atomic orbital that's conventionally the 2pz orbital, plus a weighting coefficient for the 2s atomic orbital, plus a weighting coefficient for the 2px orbital. And each of these three new atomic orbitals are going to be just like this, except they're getting unique weighting coefficients because we see building these might be different depending on which one we're talking about, psi A, psi B, or psi C. So continuing to write the new atomic orbitals out, here is psi c. Okay, these are linear combinations, right? This exactly looks like LCAO we talked about a couple lectures ago. Linear combinations, meaning we're just adding, linearly combining them these different atomic orbitals. This is our 2pz atomic orbital. You can look up the wave function for it. We've talked about it in previous lectures. This is our 2s atomic orbital for hydrogen. And we're just combining these carbon atomic orbitals in certain proportions. So this is the general description of what these new wave functions are that we're creating. And so yes, carbon still has its sort of core 1s2. Yes, it still has a 2py but it's going to create these new three atomic orbitals, right? And the shape of these three atomic orbitals is going to give us sort of this shape. Okay, so we're gonna be able to explain these sort of bonding regions in ethene based on the shape of these new orbitals we're making. The 2py orbital, is also going to lead to some bonding, and that's the pi bonding here that's created. The double bond also has sigma bonding in it, and that's coming from these newly created orbitals that are into the plane here that we are making, in addition to explaining these bonding arrangements for the hydrogens. Okay, so we know sort of what the shape should end up looking like for these hybridized orbitals. 
How do we get the weighting coefficients that explain that shape? In this example, the 2PY is the unhybridized one. So we're just talking about 2PX and 2PZ. So let's think about then. This plane here, that is ZX space. Okay, so out of the plane of the screen here and into the plane would be the Y orbital sticking up and sticking down, but that's not doing the hybridization. We're talking about the PX and PZ orbital that is being hybridized. The shapes that I'm going to end up getting will look like this. And I'm gonna color code this a little bit to again draw the negative portion of this, right? So red here is negative, and the blue here is going to be positive density, right? Which is really, sorry, not density, but the sign of the wave function, I should say. Right? You know your conventional P, Y or PX or PZ looks like this, where this would be positive and this would be minus negative. So I'm just showing the red part as the negative part here. Okay, the shapes we're going to get are going to look like this, and they're going to look like kind of difficult to draw. So these are the three. This is the one we're going to call Psi A up here. This one down here we'll call Psi C. And this one we'll call Psi B. Again, looking in the XY plane, right, the red part goes with this blue part. So maybe I'll shade just this Psi A one to distinguish it. That is a single orbital here. And on this graph, I'm showing all three of these orbitals. Okay, so this is psi a, this singular orbital, and I'm showing a projection as well of psi c and psi b on here too. So now let's think, how do we get these exact shapes? Okay, what are the c values or weighting coefficients that give us these types of shapes? Well, look at wave function a. Wave function A is a combination of 2, uh, 2PZ, 2S, and 2PX. And conventionally, you would say 2PZ looks like this. Right? So that's clearly going to be involved. And you would say 2PX looks like this. And that is not involved in Psi A. Right? There is no kind of character from this hybridized orbital that's along the z-axis here that needs any 2PX character. So this one that I'm building here, psi a, means c3 is zero, and this drops out. So what we're doing here in the next several minutes here is figuring out what each of these weighting coefficients are, because we already have functional forms, mathematical equations, for each of these atomic orbitals. We just need to find out what are the numbers that represent the weighting coefficients such that when we linearly combine these, we have these new shapes of the wave functions that I'm drawing here quite poorly, I would note. So psi a is not going to feature any of the x character. It clearly involves 2pz, the one oriented up and down like this. But it's just a combination of that 2pz and the 2s. Now, the 2s orbital, right, is spherical, it has a spherical symmetry. And so its weighting coefficients actually, here are the three weighting coefficients for 2s, c2, c5, and c8. Because it's spherically symmetric, this 2s orbital isn't going to lend 
its character any more to psi A than psi B than psi C. Okay, there can't be any sort of preferential overlap if it's perfectly spherical. Now, the case with 2px, it is not spherically symmetric. There is not going to be any contribution of this in the psi A to give us this shape. So it's allowed to be zero there. But the 2s weighting coefficient, shown here as C2, C5, and C8, aren't going to have any preferential dominance in C8, or psi A, psi B, and psi C. So these are going to be all exactly equal. And that's going to be the case when you're combining a spherically symmetric atomic orbital. This basically means it's, you know, split evenly between all the hybridized orbitals that you're creating because it's spherically symmetric. So C2, C5, and C8 are all going to be equal. But we know something else. We know that there is one 2s atomic orbital that is creating these three partial parts of the three hybridized orbitals. We've talked about in the past that a weighting coefficient squared must equal one. So if I'm accounting for all of these parts of the 2s orbital that I'm divvying up, right? I'm taking this 2s atomic orbital that looks like this and taking part of it for psi c and part of it for psi b and part of it for psi a. But when I add up all those contributions, it must equal one. Okay, any s orbital will have this character because it's getting equally divvied up between these three new atomic orbitals. It's being combined with p's in the atomic orbitals, but its contribution is exactly one third, you can think about it, in each of these three cases. Right, but we have to remember to square these weighting coefficients to know that they're summing to one. And the fact that they're all equal, and the fact that they must all sum to one, lets us solve this pretty equal, pretty easily. Okay, we find out that C2, C5, and C8 mathematically must equal the square root of one third. So that when I square C2, I get one third, C5, I get one third, C8, I get one third, and one third plus one third plus one third equals one, right? The weighting coefficient squared must sum to one to account for all of the orbital. Okay. One other thing you might have guessed is that this can be plus or minus because we're squaring it. This is the nature of quantum mechanics. We see this a lot. We always have to think about, is it positive or negative? And because I'm going to denote the blue here as positive, I need to think a little bit about what is the shape of the s orbital, right? If I gra graph it out in terms of the radial function, which I like to look at a lot of times, the graph looks like this for 2s, not like that. The graph for 2s looks like this. Right? 1s, you might remember, is just this decaying exponential. But 2s looks like this. It has one node right here. Now, this 2s atomic orbital that I'm trying to combine with 2pz here for psi a, what I want is for the positive part of this p orbital that I've shown in blue to overlap with positive character of the s orbital. Now, this is the region that will overlap much more with a p orbital. Why? Because a p orbital shape looks like this. So this is the region of the s orbital I want to overlap with the p orbital here. Okay, so if you're thinking about drawing this out, it's beneficial not to have the wave function look like this, but to have the negative of this wave function, which would be this. 
because now the negative 1s, or 2s I should say, I'm justifying why I want this to be a negative sign here, because I want this to overlap with the positive 2p wave function. Okay, so this is predicated on the fact that I've chose the up direction here of the z orbital to be the positive part of its wave function. I want that to overlap with positive character of the 2s orbital at larger radial distances. So I want this part of the s 2s wave function to actually be positive sign. So I'm going to take the negative of this s orbital. Right? The wave function for my 2s atomic orbital usually looks like this. Now I'm drawing here negative 2s. So that's where these negative signs will come from because my weighting coefficients here are negative square root of one third. So this is the kind of argument I've just used to figure out the weighting coefficients here for the 2s orbital. Okay, so now I have that, right? Now I have the weighting coefficients for the 2s orbital. Using again the fact that the c squareds must sum to one for a given atomic orbital. And the fact that I'm going to make this a negative sign because it could have been plus or minus so that I get this positive overlap here with the p. Right. Now, for c1, I can use this same kind of argument because the c's across an atomic orbital squared must sum to one. That's what we have here. But also within a given wave function, the c's must sum to one. I've proven that the px contribution for psi a is zero. So I can solve for c1. Why? Because I know the other c's that make up this wave function. Okay, so I can also identify what c1 is going to be here because it must stand to reason that within psi a, c1 squared plus c2 squared plus c3 squared must equal one. So you wanna use this sort of property of quantum mechanics that the weighting coefficients for any atomic orbital, when we're partitioning it over various other atomic orbitals, must sum to one. That's what we used here to get the 2s coefficients, and that's what we're gonna use here to get the c1 coefficient. Well, c3 is zero, we've identified that. C2. we've said is negative square root of one third. So squaring that gives me one third. So this lets me easily identify then that C1 equals plus or minus square root of two thirds. And because I've mentioned earlier that this top is positive by convention, I'm gonna keep this positive. I don't want to flip the sign of this 2p orbital that I've drawn here. All right, this is the shape of my T 2p orbital down here that I'm drawing superimposing on the 2s. I've left that positive. I haven't flipped that. I could have. I could have flipped that and left the 2s the same. It doesn't really matter. The math is going to work out. This is just convention to keep towards or, or keep our signs consistent. But this is definitely going to be plus here. So this is going to be square root of two thirds. And voila, I've fully created the expression for psi a this hybridized orbital that doesn't look completely like p right it looks a little bit like p but not entirely right and it looks like this because you can imagine this 2px orbital where this is negative and this is positive, okay, being superimposed on an s orbital, right, s is spherical, but this spherical part has a node, so you got to think of it as two spheres, okay, and this inner one, I'm going to think of as red, okay, 
and this outer one, this is the S I'm drawing now, is going to be blue. And so this blue is going to cancel out some of the red character down here. And it's going to add to the blue character up here. So the P shape gets elongated because of the favorable overlap. And it destroys some of this red character down here because the positive part of 2S is destroying the negative part of 2P. So that explains this shape graphically. But we've also done it with math and this property of wave functions. Now, we have to come up with the numbers and contributions that make these two other hybridized atomic orbitals. Again, we're attempting to explain with quantum mechanics and this valence bond theory, this shape. We're trying to sort of come up with the theory that explains this structure. And we need the atomic orbitals that are oriented certain ways. This is how they hybridize. In addition to the 2PY, which is above and below the screen or in and out of the screen, not affected with hybridization. And the 1S orbital on carbon. We still have to, of course, come up with C4, C7, C6, and C9. C4, we can make a certain argument with, if we go back here for a second, the 2PZ. Now, the 2PZ, the part of this negative density here on the 2PZ, is going to be the same sign for Psi B and Psi C. Why? Because the shapes that we're creating are both sort of pulled down the same amount, right? both in the negative Z direction and to the same extent. Right? So the fact that this angle here is supposed to be drawn as the same as this angle, just a reflection, right? the characteristic downness of these two orbitals is the same. So I know the contribution of the 2PZ orbital is the same here in both of these cases. So I know C4 and C7 are going to be equal. And I'm going to then replace C7 with C4. Okay, so C4 equals C7. Right, this is just based off a sort of geometry argument that these two, Psi B and Psi C, have the same contribution of 2PZ. Because they're pulled down the same amount and have the same shape in that Z direction. So C4 and C7 must be the same. Now, C6 and C9 do not have to be the same. Okay, and they're not going to be the same because they're not pulled the same way with respect to X. Right? One is pulled to the right, Psi C. One is pulled to the left, Psi B. So this 2PX orbital here, the sign of the wave function that I'm using when I'm combining it in Psi C is going to be the opposite of the sign I'm using for Psi B. So C6 and C9 are going to be opposites. Okay, this is the same sort of argument that we just used for C4 and C7. They're both down with respect to the z-axis and down the same amount. So the two coefficients of the z-orbital are the same for these two atomic orbitals, psi b and psi c. For the 2px, one is pulled to the right, one is pulled to the left. They're pulled the same magnitude, the shapes in the x-direction in terms of magnitude are the same, but they're opposite sign. So C6 is equal to the opposite of C9. And for Psi B, since it's the one pointing in the negative direction, I'm just gonna call this minus C6, and I'm gonna call this positive C6. Since C6 is the opposite of C9, I can replace C9 down here with C6.
Okay, so now I've simplified things, I have to come up with C4 and C6. The way I'm going to do this now is using orthogonality, which is a concept we haven't talked a ton about recently. But if you go back several lectures, we've talked about orthogonality. And orthogonality is the fact that for any two eigenfunctions, say psi a and psi b, they are orthogonal such that this is maintained. So if I take the full expression here for psi a, which is two thirds bz orbital minus one third 2s orbital. And I multiply that by psi b, c4 2 pz minus 1 third 2 ps minus c6 2 px. I can multiply all these terms out. But these are wave functions themselves too, these atomic orbitals. So they're also going to, I. Uh, obey this orthogonality rule, which is to say that anything with, say, 2s combined with a 2pz term is going to be zero. So all these cross terms that aren't the same, this cross term will matter first and first because they're both the same atomic orbital. That's not going to be zero. But when I combine this term with, say, this term, it's going to go to zero. So really, this big, long, ugly integral reduces to the following. We only keep sort of the common cross terms. And the common cross terms give me 2 thirds C4, 2PZ, 2PZ. And I'm also going to have the cross term between 2s and 2s. And that's it. There is no cross term from 2px because it's only combining with 2s and 2pz. So 2px with 2s or with 2pz is going to equal zero. So all those terms drop out. And this is the only integral I have left. Now I know in general, this is all going to be equal to zero, right? Because these complete atomic orbitals are going to equal zero. So this is still equal to zero. And I have this other useful concept here that these atomic orbitals are normalized such that the square of their wave functions integrated over all space is equal to one. So this is not as daunting as it seems. These are constants. I can take them out of the integral. And so in the end, I get 2 thirds C4 plus 1 third equals zero. After all that. And so now you should be able to go in and solve for C4. And C4 should equal square root of 1 6. And I believe we get negative square root of 1 6. And so C4, we'll go back, we'll remember, is 2PZ. Okay, which is to say, 
that the 2PZ that we're talking about here, this full 2PZ orbital, which I've drawn over here, if I've already identified what the 2S should be doing and I've flipped its sign, well, the bottom is negative and is going to destructively interfere with the 2S positive density I've created. So because these are negative, and I want favorable overlap of the 2PZ to generate these shapes, I need the 2PZ to also be negative when it's assessed to these two hybridized orbitals. Right, so I want to actually flip this and have the negative of 2PZ such that the bottom is blue to overlap with this 2S orbital part that is blue. That's what's going to give me a shape in the negative Z direction that is this positive character here and here. Because I've flipped the PZ orbital, that's where these negative signs come from. Now they're not exactly straight down because there's still a contribution of PX pulling it to the right if you're C or pulling it to the left if you're B. And so now we start to see the shapes of these things come together and we have the accurate coefficients. The last thing to solve for here is C6, and you can use two different things to solve for that. You can either use the fact that this Px squared plus this squared plus this squared equals one, or you can use within an atomic orbital that this squared plus this squared plus this squared equals one. Either way, you should get that for C6, I get plus or minus one half. Because we know C3 squared plus C6 squared plus C9 squared equals 1, and we've shown C3 is equal to 0. Well, this is equal to easy to solve because we've also, also talked about C9 equal to C6, although it's opposite, but that gets taken care of with the square. So it's easy to see that C6 is plus or minus 1 half. And if you just think about how you want to combine these things, Right, if this is the 2p x orbital, then in psi c, you want that c6 to be positive because you don't want to be flipping the sign of 2px. You want the blue to be positive in the x direction for psi c, but you want this to be in the negative direction. That is to say, you want the blue part, the positive part of the px orbital to actually be on this side. So you flip it and add this negative sign so that the 2px orbital, the blue part is going to overlap with the blue part here to create some density in the negative direction. Okay, so that explains the signs in each of these cases. So you use orthogonality, you use normalization, and you use this sort of geometric argument to explain the shapes of these things. And now we have the full explanation or the full formulas here for our hybridized atomic orbitals. Just clean this up a little bit. Okay, so psi A is two thirds of the atomic orbital 2PZ minus square, <clears throat> pardon me, minus square root of one third 2S. Psi B is negative one sixth for the 2PZ orbital, minus one third for the 2S, minus one half for the 2PX. And psi C is basically the same as psi B, except for the contribution of PX is the opposite. I had to flip this PX orbital. Okay, so 
this is going to be kind of difficult to conceptualize and follow the math the very first time through, but this is the process we go through for sp2 hybridization or sp3 hybridization or sp hybridization to come up with exact wave functions that describe those orbital shapes necessary to explain the structure of something in this case like ethene. Okay, so we're kind of working backwards to fit what we structurally know to our quantum mechanical description. But now we have the math exactly to describe the wave functions. Remember, all these symbols here are things we know exactly, the wave functions, the hydrogen atom wave functions for the 2s orbital. Right, we know. So we can plug those in here to get the full description of the wave functions. Okay, the last thing to look at here is within a given psi, whether it's psi a, psi b, or psi c, right? Psi a is the easiest to see this with. 2 thirds 2 pz. Minus 1 third 2s. When you think about the c squareds inside of a given hybridized orbital here, the z character, or the, the p character, c squared is two third. The s weighting coefficient character is one third. Okay, you can make the same sort of application here, right? 2px squared is 1 half, 2pz squared is 1 6. Those combined equal 2 thirds, 3 6 plus 1 6 is 4 6. And the s character is 1 third. Hence why we call these types of orbitals 1 third s and 2 thirds p. The p is weighted twice what the s should be. And that's the explanation for why we call this an sp2 hybridized orbital. It has twice the weight of a p atomic orbital for every s atomic orbital. And so that example takes us through weighting coefficients for hybridized orbitals within this valence bond theory. Okay, and these functional equations now, these full mathematical equations of what these hybridized orbitals look like, not only explain the shape of the experimental ethene molecule, but then let us predict other quantities, right? Because if we have the wave function, we have everything. So we can predict charge density and explain other bonding patterns and predict other sp2 hybridized molecules. Okay? It is still a bit limited because while it has some quantum mechanical features, we're still talking about sort of orbitals localized in space to build hybridized orbitals. Okay, and so these are sort of local regions of electron density, when really the Schrodinger equation and full molecular orbital theory is a bit more accurate to explain the world. But in any case, we'll get into that lecture next time with full molecular orbital theory. That'll do it for this lecture. We talked about valence bond theory and figuring out these atomic orbital coefficients or weighting factors that correspond to making these hybridized orbitals. See you in the next lecture.